impacted, just like if we don't get further assistance uh, that is impacted. You cannot do more with less when you talk about a wartime effort. It just doesn't exist. Um, and there are rules for a reason. You must have money uh, to buy things. So we also worry about our own stockpiles. So even if we could continue to deliver, what can we do to ensure American readiness does not suffer? Uh, so I worry about that in a shutdown, and I worry about that if we don't keep the, the critical aid going uh, to Ukraine, which is why uh, you saw on a bipartisan basis the Senate move forward to keep that going. Okay. Thanks for the, um, hi, Director. Hi. Um, what do you see as the end game here? Are you willing to make any concessions to the hardline Republicans, and for how long are you expecting the shutdown to last? So one, I think you get in real trouble in this town trying to play crystal ball maker. I will tell you what the fastest path is to make sure this does not happen. You saw it in the Senate with bipartisan vote to keep the government running. I think we have to remember what we're talking about, 47 days. Not a year, not two, 47 days. The point of a CR, we call them stop gaps. You keep stuff going. What did you do it on September 30th as a government? You should keep doing that on October 1. This is not hard. It is not meant to come back and negotiate and, and redo things we just agreed to do three months ago. It is to keep the government open, to give congressional negotiators more time on long-term bills. Um, this is not an exercise in reopening negotiations. We negotiated. At the speaker's request, three months ago, my life is still recovering from it. I remember it very vividly. There are no negotiations left to have on a 47-day bill. The conversation that needs to happen is with the speaker and the Republican conference, period. Thank you, Dr. Young. Um, given that FEMA is already only prioritizing urgent and life and death operations in the event of a shutdown, uh, how long can even just those operations be sustained? Look, it, it depends on, we're still in hurricane season. People think that it ends in August, September. So my answers will be uh, assuming no more major disasters happen. Everything's on the, off the table if something really truly catastrophic happens. but. On due course, we think we can continue to do life and safety from FEMA, uh, but you're right. FEMA is holding over 2,000 projects in abeyance uh, because of their current fiscal situation. When did we tell Congress about this? In mid-August. It's now late September. We told them we cannot pay our disaster relief bills in mid-August. It's now late September and they are now marching us towards a shutdown where those 2,000 projects just get longer and longer and longer. So if you are my home state of Louisiana, if you are Puerto Rico, if you are Texas, anyone who has had a major de declaration in the past who are doing long-term recovery, we have to continue to hold to pay for those, uh, those projects that are needed to continue to rebuild. Death operations, though they can continue. They can and continue, but I want you to know that statement applies if there are no more large, large events. You know, I, I we will have a different answer if there is a catastrophic uh, event that pushes FEMA uh, past the point of being ha having enough money to do life and safety. Right now, if there are no catastrophic events, we can continue to do life and safety. If, if there are, then that may not be possible. I mean, that is always the answer. I've done FEMA budgets since I was a baby staffer on appropriations. All rules, all statements are out the windows when you have large, uh, large events. They just skew the numbers needed so greatly. Thank you, Thank you. Do you have a, and I'm sorry if you mentioned this at the top, but do you have an estimate of how much does it cost? when we have a shutdown and then we reopen the government again, an estimate of, you know, per day or per week or however long it goes? Yeah, we'll say, look, our analysis on a shutdown really is tied to how long 
it happens. Uh, but one can expect like a 0.1 to 0.2 percent, I think most economists agree, hit to GDP. The hope is, though, during a shutdown, if that happened, the economy would be able to pick that uh, GDP loss up in the next quarter. So it may not be a permanent loss. But why risk our economy for a manufactured shutdown, all a problem within one conference in Congress? I say 0.1 and 2, and that doesn't sound big. 0.1% of our economy is $26 billion. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Uh, that's a hit to the economy, but is there an actual cost to you know, shutting down the government and then reopening again, like any kind of logistical admin costs? So it will not cost anything that would be outside of our normal, our normal spin rate, like the people in the office on not the 30th, because the 30th is a Saturday, on the 29th will do the work they need to do uh, today. They'll be provided like four hours on their devices to, to send people uh, and have out of office, send people last messages. Um, but there tends not to be, uh, we don't have to go close major infrastructure. There's not a, a, a large spike in spending in order to close down. What is really expensive is the hit to, to GDP the inability of people to access services like WIC. Um, and it's not just new people signing up for things like WIC, it is people who are on WIC currently. They cannot get access to the meals they would normally get. That is the real impact to the American people. Fundamentally, we've been here. Oh, I'm sorry, Ash, she was looking at me, so I got excited. Oh, no, sorry. I'll, I'll come back. I Don't let me get you in trouble. No, I, well, I promise I'll come down, but I'll okay. go Thanks, Great. Thanks, Shalanda. Um, so the Treasury Department uh, now says the federal deficit is at $1.5 trillion. Um, you know, that's more than the CBO projected. The President's pushed the bipartisan infrastructure bill. He's pushed the Inflation Reduction Act, the American Rescue Plan. He signed into spending uh, $5.8 trillion over the past two years. Spending is at the heart of this impasse. So does the President bear any responsibility for a shutdown? Absolutely not. And by the way, the deal was to ensure that we had a fiscally responsible plan. I think the name of the bill was the Fiscal Responsibility Act that saved a trillion dollars over a decade. And look, if, if House Republicans want to join us in the Fiscal Reduction Act, I'm happy to talk to them about the tax cuts they have pending in Ways and Means that add to the deficit. I'm also happy to talk to any Republican who voted for two and a half trillion dollars of tax cuts unpaid. So the problem I have is when people vote for that, bust the deficit on tax cuts for the wealthy, and then come and say we're doing too much for Head Start and child care and cancer research, because that's what we're talking about. They've taken the smallest amount of spending, do nothing about taxes for the rich, and they want to cut the smallest amount of spending. That's not serious fiscal conversation. Anybody in D.C. will tell you, you cannot get on a better fiscal path by going after these domestic programs. They are the smallest portion of our budget. It ain't going to happen. It's not serious. Even cutting it 30 percent doesn't put you on a better fiscal path. So let's just get real. It's not about that. Has one more. Um, so the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says that he's not going to take a salary during the shutdown. Does the President plan to pause his salary also? Look, I'm glad that the Speaker has made that statement. By the way, members of Congress have to get paid constitutionally, so maybe he'll put it in a sock drawer. I don't know, but they have to get paid during a shutdown. That's theater. That is theater. I will tell you, the guy who picks up the trash in my office won't get a paycheck. That's real, and that's what makes me angry. Peter. If I can ask you very briefly about we've been, we've seen this show before where it goes down on the wire and then at the last minute something happens or several days pass before anything happens. Can you just talk about fundamentally the impact, even if this were to be resolved, of playing this game where it goes the last minute before there's a short-term spending bill, how that sort of impacts the way our country runs? Because a lot of Americans see that and they know that that's not the way it can work in their own homes. You're right and you're right. I mean, we have time where the president say there's nothing inevitable in politics. We don't have to go down this road. House Republicans don't have to take us down this road. So you're right. There, There is always a chance that people can do the right thing uh, and the government remain open or have a quick reopening. Um, but even getting to this place is already 
right. ton of money lost. I, not a ton of money lost. The confidence in government is what I worry about. People watching this, the dysfunction sowed, um, and I think there are a small amount, small amount of people who know that. You know, it's the it's the carelessness by which people's like, oh, this shut down is not much of government. Well, you tell people who live paycheck to paycheck that. I know it's not popular to defend federal workers. I know it's not, but a lot of them live paycheck to paycheck. They get repaid. What are they supposed to do in the meantime? What are they supposed to do? And then people can't get government services. You go sign up for WIC. You finally convince his mother it's the right thing to do because a lot of families are embarrassed about taking aid from the government. You finally convince this young mother to go do that. Not available. Confidence lost in government. It's one more knock on democratic institutions. And that worries me. Yeah, if we get closer to a shutdown at the end of the week, uh, does it remain the case that President Biden is unwilling to meet with House uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy as he's suggested he would like to do? It's not an unwillingness. We've talked. We talked a lot. The President talked a lot to Speaker McCarthy. We got a deal. This is the easy part. People, the debt deal was two and a half years. You know what we're talking about? 47 days to keep the government running, to give Congress time to work on full year spending bills. This is not hard. This is just not hard. And by the way, every day I read some other reason why they can't vote on the Senate bill, the Senate bipartisan bill. It changes every day. So there's not, not an unwillingness. We've had this conversation. The speaker wanted to set top lines. We set them. Now he needs to talk to whomever he needs to talk to in the Republican conference and live up to that deal. What will be the engagement from President Biden to lawmakers, particularly as we get you know closer uh, Saturday, uh, tomorrow? You're talking about a, a president who was a former senator uh, for 36 years. He has close relationships on the Hill. He stays in dialogue with Congress. Clearly there's going to be an uptick in that as we um, are led down this path by House Republicans uh, and that'll continue. The President is uh, constantly updated on what is happening, um, but I'll tell you we're at the 29th, we have until midnight tomorrow. What needs to happen is the one corner out of five who is having problems with their votes and their strategies need to find a path to meet the other four, four corners at the deal we all signed up for in early summer. Thanks, Kareem. Uh, Director Young, can you talk a bit more about the impact uh, a shutdown will have on the crisis at the southern border? We asked for $4 billion to help deal with migration challenges at the border. You wouldn't know that to hear what Republicans talk about. If border is an issue for House Republicans, where is the dialogue on what the President asked for? To help with enforcement, to help with transportation costs, to help with detention capacity. You know, I've done this a long time. This is just a, 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 new, uh, a new interesting time in our political atmosphere where we can't get Republicans to really engage us on more money to help control migration issues at the border. Almost no dialogue, no interest in taking on the President's request, no interest in dealing with the fentanyl issues that we asked for more money to deal with, to put more equipment, to find fentanyl coming through. So there's serious and there's not serious. This President asked for money to help deal with issues that hurt people. Disaster, Ukraine, and border. We appreciate the Senate uh, meeting us uh, to make sure Ukraine aid continues, disaster aid continues. But let's not forget, this president asked for money to deal with the situation at the border, and you're absolutely right, during a shutdown, not only do we not get the $4 billion we asked for to help, we're asking CBP agents, ICE agents, to go without pay. How is that helping?
director, I've been speaking to many mothers who rely on WIC for food for their babies, and they don't follow the ins and outs of politics and whether a shutdown would be the fault of Congress, the White House, the president. They just can't believe that this country's leaders would allow babies to go hungry. So what would you say to them? I'd go back to my answer earlier. You know, I worry about people's engagement and thought about their government. Uh, it worries me tremendously that people will show up on Wednesday or Thursday, trying to decide whether they were going to even apply for this aid, um, because a lot of people don't trust, like their friends tell them to go get this, and they're like, oh, it's going to be difficult, a lot of paperwork. So it takes convincing to pe for people to go seek this aid. And then to be told, never mind, never mind, government's closed, shut down. They don't follow the ins and outs. It's a pox on all of our houses. That's why. Four out of the five corners are trying not to go there. We're doing everything we can to plead, beg, shame. House Republicans do the right thing, don't have this happen. Uh, the cavalierness is what gets me. I've heard people say in the Republican in House conference, oh, shutdown's not that bad. It's not like the debt ceiling. Well, you go tell people who cannot pay their daycare bill. You go tell people that. You go tell men and women in uniform that they don't get a paycheck when they show up to work every day. You go tell that mother that she cannot get formula after having had to be convinced to even give government a try. It's the cavalierness that really gets me. And you're right. It's, it, it sets an expectation for how people deal with their government throughout their lives. And it's something we should work really hard to avoid. And to follow on that, could you clarify the total number of workers that would go without pay next week and how many of them would still be required to show up to work? So in civilians, 1.5 million, about 800,000 of them uh, would be accepted and have to show up to the office. As you know, depending on how long shutdowns go, uh, people can be called back into work if their job and their duties uh, you know, f start to fall into one of the categories that's accepted. So there could be, there would be, would be changes uh, in those numbers if a shutdown would continue. And what about the breakdown for the military's 1.3 million active duty two. troops and the reservists plus DOD? Percent? Right, it's a little over $2 million, uh, 2 million people uh, who serve, who are all expected to show up to their duty stations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Director. You said uh, this shutdown could be a knock on democratic institutions. What about the international reputation of this country when it seems like the United States is going from one major fiscal crisis into another? I think you just answered it. Um, you know, this country, we owe services to the American people. We talked a lot about one of those in WIC. We talk cancer research. Um, but our diplomatic efforts, this president has worked harder than most to hold alliances together that represent democratic institutions, the Western alliance, uh, and ensure that the world knew America was back. I do believe we will continue to do most of our missions uh, as best as possible. We will show up where needed. Um, but it certainly makes that more difficult the longer and longer this goes on. Um, but in a very short-term situation, uh, I think we will remain in the same, uh, with the same posture across the world. Now the question is how we're viewed. <laughs> you know, it, it is uh, not the shining example we want to portray uh, that we continue to have fiscal crises because other world leaders uh, look at that, um, but I'm still hoping, I'm still remaining an optimist that we have a day and a half uh, to work out in one corner what is needed to take the deal that is laid before them um, by the United States Senate. So there's still a chance. Thank you, Director. Um, given that we've seen in, in prior shutdowns of some of these workers that have to go to work without pay, including in the travel industry, FAA and others, that they might report or uh, call in sick in greater numbers. Do you have any guidance around that or any estimates as to how that might affect uh, the shutdown period? Look, we don't shut down 
often. I know it may feel like it because um, we talk about it even if it doesn't happen. You sure? <laughs> um, so it doesn't happen often. So there aren't numbers. We certainly have anecdotal evidence that that happens on occasion. And it goes back to what I talked about earlier. People make decisions that are best for their families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. I hope not to see you all for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much, Director Young. Um, I, I do want to add to something that the director said, which I think was really important about how this affects families. I think I've seen on some of the cable news networks this morning, if, if it was this morning, uh, that you've seen like federal workers being interviewed and um, members of the military. And you see people, I think one interview, I, someone was crying uh, about how this is going to affect this the shutdown that we're, that Republicans in the House are bearing us to uh, is going to affect them. And we're, this is real. This is real life, uh, real life changes and real life impact on people across the country. And there was one military personnel who was interviewed who said that one of the reasons that they went into the military is to have that stability, right? Is to make sure that they have a stability in their life. And when you have one of the five uh, groups who are taking away that stability because of a political stance, because of their chaos within their own uh, within their own caucus, and they do that to a military member uh, personnel who is really truly putting their lives on the line for this country uh, and making a commitment to this country, and they're saying that they no longer have the stability that they thought the military would bring them. I think that's devastating. And that's, you know, it, this should not be partisan. This should be bipartisan. This is supposed to be the basic, basic duty of Congress uh, to do this, to do their jobs. And uh, it is going to have, if we do indeed have a shutdown, it is going to truly, truly hurt uh, some of the people that we rely on every day, uh, as well as cutting some key programs that families, uh, that families need. With that, Colleen, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, can you say anything more about what the president's plans are going to be this weekend in the face of the shutdown? What's he going to be up to? So I can say that uh, the president's going to be in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, and he's going to uh, continue to remain in touch with congressional, well, well our team here is going to continue to remain in touch with con con uh, congressional leaders and the members of uh, both parties. Certainly he's going to get updates uh, on what's uh, what's occurring happening what's happening on on the hill uh, but again if if this is this is an ex this is going to be the extreme part of the house uh, Republican it's going to be their shutdown uh, so uh, we do not I don't expect uh, any travel outside of DC from this president uh, but of course if that changes we certainly uh, would communicate that but the president will be here uh, he'll be getting updates from his team and uh, the team more broadly as you saw uh, uh, the um, the director was here uh, and uh, and also our uh, Office of Ledge Affairs is going to stay in, in close touch uh, with members, with leaders, congressional leaders on the Hill. Will you be meeting with anybody in person this weekend? I, I, no, I don't have any. I don't have any meetings or uh, to to read out as it relates to uh, to Congress. But what I can say, this is something, and we've said it over and over again, and it needs to be repeated. This is something that Congress can fix. This is something that. Extreme, those are extreme Republicans in the House can fix. They know how to fix this. We just heard the process that the OMB director went through, right, earlier, uh, earlier this summer, um, late spring, on making that, helping to make that bipartisan deal uh, become a law. And so this, we should not be here. We should, she shouldn't have been here at this podium talking about a potential shutdown. It should not have been this way. Uh, and they can fix it. Um, on the auto worker strike, so it's expanded now, um, and I just wondered if the White House is concerned about broader economic um, impact of a strike as it sort of wears on. I think it's two weeks. So a couple of things, and I've been asked this question about the uh, uh, potential impacts. Look, we always uh, we always take a look at what a major economic uh, situation the, the potential impacts could have. Uh, um, certainly in our economic, in our economy more broadly. But I will just go back to what I've said. 
this does, as it relates to the shutdown, the shutdown does, need, does not need to happen. These programs that families need uh, should be continuing. It, this, we should not be in this position that we're in. Uh, this is something that Republicans in Congress and the House more specifically are heading, heading us towards. And you, you saw there was, a, there was a chart that was up uh, when we were speaking. And, you know, Senate, Senate Republicans, Senate Democrats, House Democrats, the President, we're all on the same page. We're all on the same page here. And for some reason, extreme House Republicans refuse. They refuse to get on to get on board here. And as it relates to the shutdown, should not be happening. This can be avoided. They can fix this if they choose. If they choose. Okay. Mr. Train, um, I hear what you're saying. And about what? About <laughs> Republicans. Yes. Um, and that they have to fix this, it's their problem, it's not ours. And that's exactly what the White House said before the deal was struck about raising the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. Initially, you guys weren't going to touch any kind of negotiation because you said <coughs> it was solely up to House Republicans, up to Congress, to raise the debt ceiling. But then the President did intervene to avoid um, the U.S. defaulting. So. I'm just trying to understand at what point would the president intervene to avoid a shutdown? So I understand your question as well. Here's the thing, and, and I think Director Young did a, a really good job laying this out. What we are talking about is a bill, a bipartisan bill that became law. That's what we're talking about, something that became law, that was agreed by the, the five sides, right? The House Republicans even themselves, two thirds of them voted for this. This is law. This is an agreement that was already made, that multiple conversations were had about this. This should be simple. This should be easy. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about something that already existed not that long ago, that they all literally voted for in the House and in the Senate in a bipartisan way, something that I've said before, that's what Americans want us to do here in, 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 in Congress and in the, in the White House, right, in the federal government, to get things done in a bipartisan way so that it helps American families. And what they're doing, they can fix it. There's no conversation that needs to be had because they literally can fix this. It is their chaos. They can fix this. And what they're putting at risk is our economy, our national security, as we just talked about the military personnel. It's a, you know, and, you know, we have been able, the president in the last two years have been able to get our economy back on track, right? We've talked about the 13.5 million jobs. We've talked about unemployment being under 4%. And what they're doing is incredibly irresponsible and it is reckless. So that's the difference when you're asking me, you know, you don't quite understand and or trying to figure out what we're talking about. We already made the deal. That's why we keep saying a deal is a deal. And it's not just, it's, it's majority of Congress that agrees with us, right? When you think about what the Senate, the Senate actually moved forward and kept their deal. When you think about 77 senators who are moving forward, who voted to move forward with their CR, they are keeping the deal. We're talking about a small fraction of Congress, and that's, and that's reckless, that's irresponsible. And that's why we're saying it is not us for us, to, it's not on us to fix, it's not on this president to fix, it is on Congress to fix. And it's not just us. You, I, I started a briefing listing out, uh, listing out quotes from, quote from uh, Republicans in, in Congress themselves. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on China, can you clarify if the administration is stepping up engagement um, with the goal towards a Biden-Xi meeting on the sidelines of APEC in November, uh, including whether there are any plans for Vice Premier Heli Feng or Prime Minister Wang Yi to come visit in Washington or meet U.S. officials? I don't have anything to, to lay out for you on any meetings or any potential meetings as it relates to the President and uh, our President and President Xi. The President spoke about this very recently and his expectations to have a meeting. Don't have a location for you, don't have a timeline for you at this time. We're expecting the President, as he said, is expected to do so. Uh, just don't have anything to share. And once we do, we certainly will share that with you. Let me follow up on that. Just a few days ago, Wang Yi seems to suggest that the onus of creating the right environment for a Biden-Xi meeting lies in Washington, um, 
you know, to promote cooperation, a summit that promotes cooperation rather than provoke confrontation? How would you respond to that? I mean, we're, I mean, we've been very clear. We're not, ha we're not looking to have confrontation with China. We're looking to have competition, and that's what the president has shown this last two years. The president spoke about this. He's, he's looking forward to having that conversation with President Xi. I don't have anything to share with you at this time, uh, and I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, go ahead. Does the president plan to take up McCarthy's offer to meet, and does the White House see any value in that? Look, I'm going to be very clear. The, per the person that McCarthy or the people that McCarthy needs to talk to is his own caucus. That's who he needs to have a conversation about with, not the president. The president had multiple conversations with Speaker McCarthy very early on to get this bipartisan deal that two-thirds of the House, uh, Republican House, Republicans' House voted on. The conversation is not between the president and McCarthy. He needs to – he needs to – he need, what I'm saying very clearly is the conversation needs to happen between Speaker McCarthy and his and his caucus. That's where that's the fix. That's the chaos that we're seeing, and that's where he needs to focus on. And how would you describe the president's relationship with Senator Feinstein in recent years? When was the last time they spoke to one another? So I believe uh, the president reached out back in August. Uh, they missed each other, and so the president had a conversation with her chief of staff. Uh, that is the last time that they were that the president had reached out. I mean, the president spoke to this. You know, very. Um, I think it very deeply, right? And just moments ago, when you all watched his remarks, um, and uh, and they were very close friends. They served together for over a decade. I believe 15 years in the Senate together, and uh, and he saw her as a, a close friend. They, you know, it, one of the things that they worked on uh, that is an issue right now across the country was assault ban weapons, right? That is something that they worked together on in 1994. Uh, and actually saved lives for those 10 years before its sunset in 2004, right? So there's been many things that they've been able to work on together, and so they find, and even as president as well, uh, and so they were, he sees her as a dear friend. Uh, it is a sad day uh, for, certainly for, uh, for us here and also for her family and clearly for the state of California, uh, and, um, and I'll, just, I'll just leave it there. Okay, thank you. We just heard Director Young saying this is not hard, uh, but Speaker McCarthy clearly is finding this difficult. Um, can you give us any sense of how President Biden sees the situation that Speaker McCarthy is in? Um, does he think that the Speaker is in a tough spot? Have you gotten the sense that, you know, there's any sense of sort of sympathy uh, towards Speaker McCarthy, or is it all pure exasperation? I, look, I'm, I, I'm not going to go into um, – the, the, the president's feeling about the speaker or um, or his situation currently as speaker of, of the house what I can speak to is what we've been saying all along which is a deal was made the president had as you all know and and saw this happening when uh, when these conversations were going on in person and trying to get that bipartisan deal very early on uh, in the summer and the, what the president believes is that many Americans are going to be hurt by this Many families are going to be hurt by this, by something that extreme House Republicans are barreling us down through, right? They're heading us uh, down a road that is unfortunate, that is reckless. And that's what the president is concerned about. He's concerned about the American people. And this is something, again, they can fix this. They can. Can you confirm when the two men last spoke? Uh, I don't have a date or time, uh, a timeline of when they last spoke. Uh, what I can say is that um, clearly um, uh, the OMB director, Congressional um, our Office of Ledge Affairs has been in regular touch with congressional leaders on this uh, for the past several weeks, uh, several months, and I just don't have a, I don't have a conversation to uh, confirm with the speaker. And just in the coming days, in the event of a government shutdown, does the White House uh, believe that the president um, has a responsibility to offer any words of reassurance to people in the country who will be affected, will be worried about the situation. So look, um, I don't have any um, uh, previews of any remarks that the president's going to make, but you can, with, uh, either tomorrow or any upcoming days, but of course the American, uh, the president is always, uh, when it comes to situations like this, you can expect to hear from him directly. Uh, um, in the days ahead, I just don't have a date uh, to speak to at this time. And the president, here's the thing, the president's not going to stop working. He's going to continue to work, uh, and uh, he's not going to stop delivering for the American people in the event of an extreme Republican shutdown. You're going to hear from the president. I just don't have anything to lay out on a specific date or time. Uh, but, of course, the American people are going to hear from him. Okay, Mandy. Thank you. Um, just on the auto <coughs> strike, 
Has the president uh, spoken to automakers after he said he supports a 40% pay raise for UAW workers, or just even broadly after his visit uh, to Michigan? Uh, we understand from sources that the chances of the deal uh, in the near term have been complicated by the president's remarks uh, about him supporting a 40% pay raise. So I just want to just give some clarity. So first, the president's uh, senior advisors, they've been in touch uh, with all parties. Uh, if uh, I'll let you know if there's any conversations that the president uh, has or to read out with uh, with the the uh, automakers more specifically as it relates to the 40%. Uh, look, he believes they should get a significant raise. That's why the president can keep saying like a record profit should lead to a record contract, right? This is he believes that the UAW uh, workers uh, should get a fair share for uh, for profits they help create. And so the president has been really, really clear about that. But as it relates to any negotiations and what they are asking for, he wants to make sure that he leaves that up to the EUAW leadership. And ultimately, uh, again, members should be able to receive a fair and just deal. And the president's going to be consistent about that. He has said that recently when he was in Michigan, when you saw him on an active picket line, who is he was very proud to be there in solidarity of the union workers. And so that is something that he has said uh, throughout his career. He'll continue to be very clear about that. So just on the automakers yeah. part, um, you, you said his team is constantly in touch. And, uh, we've known that. Are there any specific <coughs> conversations after his visit, specifically after the, those comments? That well, they've been in regular touch. Uh, I don't have, like, if they talk today or, or on, on Tuesday or Wednesday, but they have been. Uh, the senior uh, senior advisors have certainly have been in touch with all parties. They are not, I want to be clear, they're not part of the uh, negotiations. They're not convening all sides. They are just there to offer any assistance that the parties might need. We are very, we've been always very clear. It's, it's, it's up to uh, the UAW leadership. It's up to the union uh, to have these, uh, uh, all parties involved to have these negotiation uh, conversations. Uh, but again, we've just offered uh, any helpful assistance that they might need. Um, can I circle back, thank you, uh, to a question that was asked, I think, of the OMB director, which is essentially if we could get a, a sense of what the White House will look like during the shutdown and who all um, folks can anticipate will be here, specifically from the press side, but broadly what the White House will yeah. look like. Um, so, look, it, it, you know, and, and not going to have much more to share than what uh, the OMB director said. You know, many people are going to be furloughed. Uh, that's kind of unfortunately how this all works. Uh, the process that we are uh, kind of dealt with here uh, as we're dealing with this uh, potential uh, potential shutdown. Um, but uh, we will do our best, certainly, to communi continue communicating with all of you. We will have a press uh, a press briefing um, uh, 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 during during you know next week. Uh, and um, look, you know, again, they're going to be furloughed. And some will be expected and continuing to work, as the as the director said, and uh, and that's going to be across the government. That's going to be the same case here at the White House, uh, and you know that's just kind of the way it is. And we will we're going to continue to deliver for the American people, but it's not going to be as business as usual when you have majority of folks furloughed, and uh, and that's kind of where we are, uh, uh, sadly, unfortunately, in this in this time. But as it relates to the press team, certainly we'll be holding press briefings. Um, and uh, we'll certainly have more to share if this is where uh, we head down to, uh, which is a shutdown. Thank you, Karine. Uh, just to follow to Aurelia's earlier question, uh, you know that you say it's their problems, not ours. Uh, from the outside, outside of the U.S., we see the government in more of a one thing. Uh, with you know the tension with China towards allied uh, in the war in Ukraine, what can the president? say to reassure leaders who are worried at this uh, at this moment so you know i think jake sullivan got this question a little bit when he was here last week um, and I think the question came to him is, has he heard any concerns from any leadership? And he had said uh, he wasn't aware of any conversations uh, uh, to, uh, to that effect. What I can say is, uh, um, you know, when you have this type of um, um, this potential chaos and unpredictability, uh, you know, countries around the world are seeing from this, this uh, Republican House, it's not something to be proud of. It's not. Uh, but what the president and our team have done for the past two years is rebuild those relationships with our partners and allies. Uh, and, uh, and, and so 
at the same time trying to carry out the work of the American people. And that's something that you've seen the president do over the past two years, whether it's here uh, at the White House or whether it's at a summit that he's attended. And you've seen the president build that confidence uh, back into the United, uh, back into the world, right? The confidence that allies and partners had of the United States. Uh, and so that's important. We have rebuilt uh, those relationships will continue to do so. But obviously, uh, when you see this type of chaos, uh, uh, you know, chaos and potential recklessness, right, from House Republicans, it doesn't, it's nothing to be proud of. Uh, but we're going to continue to have those, doesn't stop us to have, continue those, those diplomatic conversations and continue to build those, those relationships. Uh, thank you. Um, th this time of week, we're usually talking about the week ahead. Um, and I wonder how yes. that's impacted by the government shutdown, if the president has any plans for next week. Yeah. It, it, and I'm assuming that people who would facilitate his travel would be essential. But yeah. is that impacted at all by the shutdown talk? So it's a really good question, Matt. This is something that we have been internally uh, trying to figure that out, uh, what it's going to look like if we have a, uh, a extreme House Republican shutdown. That is something certainly we've been uh, very focused on. Look, um, as I said, the president's going to be staying in DC. Uh, you, you could you could be assured that the American people and you all are going to hear from him uh, on a regular basis uh, in the next upcoming days uh, because he's going to continue to work for the American people. I can't speak to travel right now. Right now, we're going to focus on um, focus on just the next couple of days and what that's going to look like. Again, he's not he's going to stay here in D.C. and we're going to continue to work for the American people. Yes, people are going to be furloughed. It's not going to be business as usual, but we're going to continue to do our best to work on behalf of the American people. It's, it also sounds like you guys don't view there being any need for a negotiation from the White House perspective. So, I, yeah. in, in thinking about like what is he, what is the work that he needs to do in in your eyes? Is is the work communicating to the American people about this, or is there any? I mean, is he going to be in touch with anybody on the Hill? Like, yeah. I'm just trying to think through. No, the it's weekend. a good. It's, it's all good questions. Look. The president is going to say what privately what he's been saying publicly, right? And he, he has spoken to this almost every day this week about the shutdown, about what Republicans in the House are doing. He's been very clear about this, right? He's talked about the economic impact. When he when he was doing uh, the uh, meeting with HBC, HBCU uh, a Board of Advisors, his Board of Advisors, he talked about the impact on, uh, on, on the black community specifically. He's talked about uh, impacts just broadly with, with American families and Americans. So he has been very uh, clear about this, and we are going to continue to be clear about this. And the reason why, just to go back to what I stated earlier to, to we the reason why we're not negotiating is because we already did that. We did negotiate. The president spoke multiple times with congressional leadership on this. Um, and there was a bipartisan piece of legislation that was agreed upon, that was passed, that was made into law. And so this is something that Congress, and this is this sits with, really, when we say House Republicans, it really sits with them. Because we saw what the Senate was able to do in a bipartisan way, which is keep keep their promise, move forward with the deal that we've made. And we know House Democrats are on board to keep the government open and keeping with the deal that was made. It's just this really small, extreme fraction in, in the Congress. These extreme House Republicans that continue to hold this uh, to hold this back because they want to push extreme uh, policies that's going to hurt Americans, and so that's why we say that uh, because that is the fact that is what's happening and being played out uh, on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue. And so, look, the president's going to continue doing the job. American people are going to hear from him over the next couple of days, and yes, he'll be in D.C. Okay. Anticipating if there is a shutdown, the president has never come to the briefing room, and if it would facilitate and make it easier with staff furloughs for him to speak to us from here, we always invite the president to come to the briefing room. Um, we appreciate the invite. The, um, the issue of debt ceiling played out in a similar way, where the position was, it's their job to do it. And then when a critical hour came, the president engaged. If it goes to a shutdown, would he then view it as, okay, there's a new chapter to this in terms of resolving it, getting out of it, and would he feel like he needs to engage more at that point? Would that be a different we, mindset? We should ask me a similar question as you did. And um, we're going to be very clear about this and you know, don't want to get into hypotheticals from here because we believe that this can be fixed. Uh, we believe that House Republicans can fix this. It is their job to fix this. 
uh, so not going to get into too far down the road. Would he see it as a different set of circumstances? You know, I, I, I just want to be careful, right? Okay. Because again, I don't want to get into hypotheticals. We see this as a, as a situation that could be fixed because we already made a deal. A deal is a deal. When we say that, it is true. A deal is a deal. That's what they are disputing here, something that two-thirds of House Republicans voted on. So they can fix this. This is something that they can get, uh, they can get on board with because it's something that they voted on. It is something that they voted on. Uh, and so what I'm going to say is continue what we've been saying is that the conversation is not is not with this president. The conversation is with Speaker McCarthy and his caucus. They need to have that conversation and get this done on behalf of the American people. Millions of Americans are going to be hurt by this, by their action, and it is reckless and it is irresponsible. I have to go. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on Monday. Thank you.